Welcome to this chapter called Closing the Real Estate Transaction. You will hear this called by many names. The settlement. Sometimes I've heard passing papers. Uh, but I like to call it payday. All right. So everything we have been discussing up until now will culminate in today's activity of the closing of the real estate. We're going to talk about the two sides, you know, the buyer side and the seller side and what they are going to do, and what they're going to expect to happen. We're going to talk a little bit about the laws that deal with the settlement procedure the actual procedure on how we do all of this closing. So sit back, let's get ready and let's get started. All right, so when dealing with the closing, there's going to be two sides to this. We're going to talk about both sides. Now remember, if you represent one side or the other, that is called single agency. And you could potentially work both sides, which is called dual agency. Um, so you may end up doing both sides of this. There are some pre-closing procedures that have to be done. And this is what you have been doing for that last 30 days, 45 days. You know, you've been having the inspection. You got the appraisal. You did all of this stuff and all of that is going to lead up to the day of closing. So let's talk a little bit about what the buyer side is going to want. So the buyer's main concern is that he gets what is called a clear title. He wants the seller to be able to deliver a good title or a clear title. Remember when the buyer wrote the purchase agreement, in that purchase agreement, he asked for a general warranty deed. And one of the statements in that general warranty deed said that the seller will remove all of the encumbrances. That is what the buyer is looking for, is this thing called good title. Now, there's some other things the buyer's going to be looking for in his stack of paperwork. And it's all going to be in this paperwork that the title company will present to the buyer. So don't really have to worry about telling them uh, they're going to know. All right. There may be things like the survey that's in the buyer's packet. There may be the title insurance policy that's in the packet. There's going to be the appraisal that the lender had done. There could be a lease if the buyer's buying a rental property. So all of these things are going to be in there. There could be a receipt of something that got paid, but yet hasn't been recorded yet. We have seen this many times where something popped up on the title work and the seller went, oh man, I forgot about that. And he went and paid it off. But remember, I spoke about the fact that there is a physical delay in recording. There is a process where they have to go down and record and it has to get stamped and all of that. That is a physical process. And in some counties could take four, five, six weeks to actually get recorded. Well, you don't want to wait on that. So it's possible that the seller may bring a receipt showing that it's paid to the closing because it may still be on the records as being a lien. We had this with one of my sellers years ago. It was a good friend of mine and thank goodness, um, because I could be a little more, you know, blatant with him. And there was an American Express lien that Brent had forgot to pay, and they had put a lien on his property. And he was, you know, fat, dumb, and happy and didn't even realize it. We sold his house. It popped up on the uh, records. So while we were doing this whole closing process, he was working with American Express to get it released and paid. 
Well, he got it paid like six or seven days before closing. So American Express actually sent a notarized letter to Brent saying that this lien has been paid and will be recorded. And then it was signed by their legal counsel and it was notarized. So when we went to closing, the buyer saw this lien, but yet Brent said, well, here's the receipt showing that it's paid. It just has not been recording, recorded. So while it looks like there's a lien on the property, there really isn't, all right? You might see some of those, all right? Now, another thing the buyer is going to want to do is what we call the final walkthrough or the final property inspection. And this is a very highly suggested activity. It's not required. There's no state law that says it has to happen. But you as the buyer's agent better explain the ramifications to going or not going. And I have seen people go to close or go to a final walkthrough and there be no problems. That's what I hope you get. There could be going to a final walkthrough and there could be issues that have to be resolved. There could be not going to a final walkthrough and there be no problems. And the worst case, obviously, is the buyer to not go to a final walkthrough and then there be problems after it closes, all right? Because that is going to result in a lawsuit. Once the buyer takes the property, he is taking it in that as is condition. So you want to make sure that you go look at it before closing. Now I try and train my new agents that they want to look at the property as close to the time of closing as possible. That way, nothing happens. If you went, for example, if you went two or three days before, there's two or three days of something that could happen. So I usually try and tell my agents, hey, schedule a closing like at uh, one or two o'clock in the afternoon and um, go to the walkthrough like at 9 a.m. Because what you're trying to verify is all of the repairs that you ask for have been completed. You also want to make sure that the property is in the same condition that it was when you made the offer. Remember, you made this offer about 30 days ago, 45 days ago. So you want to make sure that all four walls are there and the roof's still on it. That. You want to make sure anything that you ask to stay, like the washer and dryer, is actually there. And the other side of that is you want to make sure things that you specifically ask to be gone are actually gone. Okay? Had a deal several years ago. House was beautiful. However, there was a stack of wood along the back side of the house. And we ask the other agent, hey, hey, what's the wood for? This house doesn't have a fireplace. And the seller said, oh, the, or the seller's agent said, oh, the sellers are campers. And they take the wood with them when they go. So that's their wood. We're like, great. Our home inspector says this is a great place for wood destroying insects to be formed. We don't want that wood because there's no fireplace. Make sure it's gone. So the day of our final walkthrough, we get there and the house is vacant and everything's great, except this rick of wood is still leaning up against the backside of the house. So I call the other agent and I'm like, hey dude, this wood is still here. Are you guys going to get it? Now, you get to play chicken. You guys know what chicken is? Chicken's an old game where it used to be people would like drive towards each other and see who swerves first and see who flinches because the other agents said, oh, come on, Raymond, it's just a stack of wood. Would your buyers not close on their dream home over a stack of wood that we forgot? And now you get to say, oh, come on, listing agent. Would your sellers lose a sale 
over a stack of wood. Because here's the deal. In this particular case, I had the upper hand. Because the house was vacant, which means the sellers had already moved out. And I told the other agent, dude, my buyers may not buy. Now, would they have? I doubt it. But you get to use that hammer because I told them, I said, look, if my buyers not decide not to buy over this, guess what your sellers are going to have to do? <laughs> Move back in. All that stuff they moved out, put in the truck, and they now got to put it back in because there's no sale. Would your sellers really risk all of that for not doing something that we literally asked for? I mean, it wasn't like at the last minute we said, oh, yeah, and by the way, no, we actually put that in the purchase agreement that the wood on the south side of the back of the house should be removed prior to closing. So he said, okay, hold on. So he, we were standing in the house, and about that time, we see a pickup come around to the back, and it's a father and a son who were got out through all the wood in the back of the pickup and they were calling us every name in the book, you know, and they threw it in the back of the pickup and drove off. So they did come and get it. So when we went to closing, everybody was happy, but that is a case of you wanting to make sure. I had a situation several years ago where a guy, we were scheduled to go to the walkthrough and he said, Hey, I can't make the final walkthrough. I'm the, first shift manager for this production company and I can get off for the closing, but I can't get off four hours early. Um, he goes, it'll be okay. I'm like, okay, David, but you understand. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. So we go to closing, closing happened, boop, title transfers. I get home later that night, about six o'clock, I get a call from him and I'm like, and he said, Hey, Raymond, just wanted to let you know that when I got back to the property, the sellers took every light bulb in the house. I'm like, what? He's like, yes, they took the light bulbs out of the light fixtures. They took the light bulbs out of the bathroom, out of the bedroom, out of the chandeliers, all of them. They took every light bulb. What can I do? And I told him, I said, well, go buy light bulbs. And he's like, well, can I sue them? I'm like, most certainly, but it is now a lawsuit because when you accepted the property, you accepted it in that condition. You chose to not go look at it. And because of that, you now have a house with no light bulbs. And he's like, well, I'm going to file a lawsuit. I'm like, okay, it would be a small claims case. But in the meantime, you're going to have to go buy light bulbs because lawsuit small claims is going to be three or four weeks. You're going to live in the dark. <clears throat> so he actually <laughs> had to go buy light bulbs. Now there's more to that story that can be a whole bunch of fun because a couple days later he called me and said, Hey, I filed a small claims. It cost me like $280 to buy all these light bulbs. So I filed a small claim suit. I'm like, Oh wow. That's, that's cool. I guess. And he said, I want you to come up and testify. And I said, absolutely not. Because remember what else happens at boop, the closing, the title transfer. Not only does title transfer, but agency terminated. Remember one of the things that terminates agency is the completion of the deal. So when he closed on that property boop, and it transferred, he became the owner in severalty of that property and my agency terminated, which means I no longer have care, obedience, loyalty, disclosure. I still maintain that accounting and confidentiality, but this directive to me to protect him by coming to this small claims court would have fallen under loyalty or care. It was gone. And I told him, I'm like, no, I'm not coming up there. I told you to go to closing. You didn't go to closing. 
I am not driving way to the north side of Indianapolis to go to a small claims court. You can go to that small claims court and you can, you know, talk to the judge and let him decide, but I no longer care. Now, I'm guessing I probably did not get any referrals from that client after that because he kind of got mad at, with, at me. But I told him he didn't follow and then he paid the price. Okay. Um, the buyer's also going to want to see a survey just to make sure that he knows there was the boundary. And it could be a plat. And we go back to that chapter where we're talking about, you know, lot five of modular estates per plat book 41. That is usually the most common because the house or property is already laid out. He's going to want to see title evidence. He's going to want to make sure that the title insurance policy is in place. They're going to have those title searches that is going to be made. That is also something that the buyer is going to want. Now, what does the seller want? Well, really, it boils down to one major thing. <laughs> right. He wants the money. He wants to make sure that the money is there, that the lender that the buyer has borrowed the money from, the lender will wire the money into the closing company. Now, there's a very important factor you need to understand currently. At the closing, the money that the borrower borrows from a lender is actually considered a credit to the borrower. Now, I know most of you go, that's not true. I, it's a debit. I got to pay for it. It will be a debit when you sign the IOU. But the money the lender has placed in the title company is very much a, like your buddy handed you some money and said, here's some money. Go, go buy your house. That's what's going on. So the lender is going to wire money into the title company in that loan amount that you agreed upon. And that is going to be seen as a credit to the buyer. At the closing table, I, I the buyer, I'm going to bring in my down payment money. And my buddy, whose name is Chase Bank, has given me $280,000 it is going to be a credit on the closing documents because it is a loan that I borrowed. So when we get to this a little later, please don't be confused because the loan is going to show up as a credit for the closing. And then you sign it and the IOU and you make the mortgage and the, as the mortgagor, now it's a debit that you owe to your lender. But at the closing, it's a credit to the borrower. What is the role of the real estate professional? Well, it's a real easy role. Bring me my money. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, so what happened? What is your job as the real estate professional at the closing, most states require that the uh, client be represented at the closing. So you have to be there. Now, I will tell you, if you've done your job correctly up until this point, you will actually be worthless or should be useless at the closing, right? Because you are only there in the capacity to help explain something that your client doesn't understand. You should have explained all this prior to that. So literally, a good agent is useless at closing. I know it sounds funny because literally you should have already explained. Now that client could go, hey man, what is this form? And you go, oh, well, that's the lead-based paint form. Remember, we talked about it. You got to fill that out. That's what you're there for. But you should have already done all of that. Typically, what happens, and let's see if we can do it on this camera. Most 
agents so way down here out of view of everybody and you sit facing the other agent and you're doing stuff like that. So how's your business going? Yeah, well, my kids are tired. I've got volleyball tonight with my children. And then you go, oh, what? we're done. Okay, thank you. So that is your role is to help answer questions. And they may look to you for guidance or assistance, but theoretically you should have done all of that. Now the, the, the joke that I just made is actually kind of true because this is the time at which you will collect the check that it was our commission, all right? Now that check is going to be made out to the brokerage name in which you represent. Now, if you're the managing broker, then potentially it could be you. But remember, you are representing me, the Modulin Group, or Keller Williams, or Fathom, in this closing. So they cannot pay you directly. You can only receive pay from your employing broker. So the check will be made out to the company name. And what happens is you go back to the office and you turn it into your office admin and go, hey, I had a closing. Here's the paperwork, which we're going to talk about. And the check. Now the broker takes that check. And then based on whatever split you had agreed to, which we've discussed in the previous chapter, he will then write you a check out of his general account so that you now get paid. That time frame can vary, and technology now allows for all kinds of things. For example, in our company, we don't write checks. Everything's now direct deposit. We take the money, put the money right in your bank account so that you have it. So it, it, the technology or the mechanics could be different. But theoretically, you bring the check into the office for the total commission, and then I write you a check for whatever split we agreed on, that 50-50 or 80-20 or whatever it is. So that is the process. Now, you will also be given some documents that we as the brokerage must keep under state law. Typically, it is a copy of whatever client you're serving. If we are the selling agent, meaning we're working with the buyer, we'll get a copy of those documents. If we're working with the seller, i.e. the listing agent, we get a copy of those documents. Those documents must be kept by the brokerage for a spe specified amount of time. Usually it's three years, could be five years. Some forms maybe is only one year. But those documents you would bring as well. Most brokerages use that as the hammer, meaning, hey, you didn't bring me all the documents, so I'm not going to cut you your check yet because you're missing a form. And your brokerage that you work for will have a procedure and they will educate you on, hey, we need these documents and we need a commission payout form or we need whatever form. And those, that's usually our hammer because you brought me the check and I'm going, well, I'm not paying you because you're missing a document. And I don't want to go chase it. You better go chase it. And then when you bring that in, now your package is complete with all of the documents. Now I'll pay you. Okay. So that is your um, role at the closing is one is to provide services still because it's still our client. Now, like I said, when that title transfers, boop agency technically ends so when you walk into the closing you are actually walking in with a client because we still have agency with them once the deal gets completed boop, the title transfers we have fulfilled our agency and technically under the eyes of the law you would walk back out of that building with a customer now because agencies terminated. Now, we all still treat them like a client because when you get in the parking lot, you're like, hey, good job. Here's a couple of my business cards. 
If you've got friends or family and you want them to get the great service that I gave you, Pat, feel free to pass my card out and refer my name. All right. But technically, it's a customer at that point. The lender is actually going to have an interest in this. And typically, the lender's interest is the same as the buyer's interest. He may want a copy of the survey. He may want a copy of the title insurance policy. He may want a copy of your homeowner's insurance policy to make sure the house has insurance. He may get other reports like the uh, septic report or the well report or the termite report. They may get what's called the certificate of occupancy, which we haven't got to yet, but it's for a new bill. They may have all kinds of requirements that the buyer has. They may ask for proof of, re of receipts for that lien that got paid off but doesn't show yet. So their interest virtually is identical to the buyer's interest. If your loan came through a mortgage broker, he may show up as well because he gets paid that day too for brokering the loan between you and Chase Bank. So your mortgage broker may show up. Now, typically when they do, they don't show up and sit through the whole closing because their main interest is one, picking up the check, but two, smoozing with you when you're done as compared to the real estate agent who's going to be involved with questions the mortgage broker typically is not sitting in the closing he could if he's a good friend of yours he may do it just to show that hey i'm a good guy and i'm here in case you have loan questions so the mortgage broker may show up the irs has an interest in this because you may have made a profit on the sale of your property and they want to make sure that they know there was a profit so that they can expect you to pay taxes on it. Now, remember back in a previous chapter, if you are single and you profited less than $250,000 and you live there more than two out of five years, there are no taxes. If you're married, it's the first 500. So you, they will have to know that. Well, I bought it for 300, sold it for 400, and I'm single. There would be no taxes because you did not meet that cap of $250,000. The seller will have to have an IRS interest because he's going to want some tax deductions on down the line, like uh, interest on a loan real estate taxes. He's going to qualify for a homeowner's exemption. So the IRS has interest in this closing as well. So let's talk about the actual mechanics of conducting the closing. There are many names that is used, and I have seen them vary state by state by state. Like I said earlier, we can call it the settlement. We can call it closing the escrow. You can call it passing papers. Uh, I call it payday. Whatever terminology you use in your area or state that you're sitting in, you will learn this one real quick. Now, there are typically two ways to do this closing. And I'm going to tell you that since 2020, a couple years ago, there have bastardized some of these to create these infinite number of ways now that they can close. But generally, they fall in two categories. The most common one I would have told you is what we call a face-to-face -face closing. All right. This is where both parties show up at the same time and one sits on one side of the table and the other sits on the other side of the table, and that is the most common, and that's why you will often hear this called a side. I've got the seller side. I've got the buyer side. If I have both, and you would say I've got both sides, there are a lot of companies that count how many sides you do a year 
so that you could go, well, I closed 24 sides. Most agents say I closed 24 uh, uh, closings. But if you did both, that might count as two, all right, in your company or in your MLS system that tracks leads. And there are people that are really big on how many closings I had because they feel nice and proud to go, people, well, I closed 64 closings. Well, I closed 30, but they were all dual agencies, so that's 60 sides, all right? So face-to-face -face is the most common one. This is the one where both parties sit at the same table. You sit on your side with your client. I'm sitting on that side with your client. And it's typically held at a title company. Could be in an attorney's office. It could actually be anywhere that you want to close it as long as both parties agree. We've closed at uh, libraries before. I've closed in our office before. You could close at um, any place you guys both agree. I've seen closings happen at, uh, um, what's that Mexican restaurant? Um, Chipotle. Went into lunch one day in Chipotle and there was a closing going on. Now, I knew what it was because I recognized the setup um, and was heard some of the, overheard some of the conversation. So I know it actually was a closing going on. And that is attended by the buyer and the seller and their respective real estate agent. There could be attorneys. I had closed a, I was joking with someone the other day. I closed a commercial deal several years ago where there were nine people in the closing room and I was the only one that was not an attorney. The buyer was an attorney, but he had an attorney with him. The seller was an attorney and he had his attorney. The closing person that worked for the title company, because this was a high-end commercial, it was like $27 million. He was an attorney that closed it. The lender showed up before they were going to wire $27 million in who had their attorney. So there was like, I was like the only one that was not an attorney in that deal. So they could be everywhere. And that usually slows the process down because they argued over pro, the word proration for like 20 minutes. But there could be attorneys there. There could be other people like the mortgage broker I mentioned. There could be a person representing the title company. So there could be many different people in this closing. And typically, the principals in the closing, i.e. the actual buyer and the seller, sit closer to the head of the table because that's where all the action is and everybody else sits further away, okay? The person that actually runs it will be called the closing agent or sometimes a closing officer or just the closer or in some cases it's just Mary. Hey, Mary, glad to see you. They are the one that will be guiding this exchange or guiding this passing of papers. That's why it's sometimes called that. This closing officer <clears throat> is always a notary public. They have the power to notarize documents. That's why if you bought or sold a house recently, you know that when you go in, typically the first thing the closer says is, hey man, do you have your ID? Do you have your ID? And they will collect the ID of all the principals involved, the sellers and the buyers. If there's multiple, like husband and wife, and they're signing the deed, they will definitely have their ID checked so that this person, as they're signing, they will notarize and put their notary stamp. And remember, they are notarizing to show what? Two things. Is it you? And are you signing on your own volition? So the title company closing officer or the closer is almost always a notary as well. They will make sure that everything is done in a specific order. As I mentioned, the principal sit closer to the head of the table. The closer usually sits on the end of the table like this because they will be serving both parties. They will be helping both parties. Hey, here's the document. Please sign this. Then they notarize. Hey, buyer, here's the loan documents. Please sign this. And then they notarize them. 
So they will sit at the head of the table and the principals sit closer to them and everybody else falls in line down the end of the table. And like I said, a lot of times you just sit at the end of the table and you're watching Facebook through the, on your phone the whole time and go, oh, we're done? Okay. That's what you would happen. The second way that we can close this is called closing in escrow. Now, you've heard this word before when we talked about taxes are being escrowed or insurance premiums are being escrowed by the lender. Remember, escrow just means it's being held for someone else in a secure spot. So you could close in escrow as well, meaning that both sides of the deal, the buyer or the seller, cannot be at the same location at the same time. This will happen. You know, typically a common way is, hey, I can't make the four o'clock closing because I'm a surgeon and I've got to do a surgery. So they may go in early in the morning and sign their half of the documents. So when they sit at the table on their side, there's literally no one on the other side. And they sign all their documents. And then this third party escrow agent, which is typically the title company, will take those documents and place them in a safe inside of their location. And then at four o'clock, the other side comes in. And when they sit at the table, there's no one on the other side because they've already been there. And the title closing agent will go and get the documents and bring them out and set them down and go, okay, here's the documents that have already been signed. Now you need to sign your portion and they will close them in escrow. And then once they're signed, they will call that agent from the people that were in the early and go, hey man, we're now closed, come and get your documents. And the buyer will come in later or tomorrow, or you come in and pick up all of the documents that we needed or that your client needed if you're helping them out. So that would be closing in escrow where they're not face to face, okay? <clears throat> escrow company could be anybody, just it's, it's whoever the closer is in your state. Like in South Carolina, they use uh, attorneys. In Indiana, we use title companies. And basically, this is what I was saying here. The agent will, the closing agent or the closing officer will collect all of these documents and hold them in escrow until the other client comes in. Now, in some cases, they may be not in the same geographical region, like a buyer buying a property that may be a bank-owned home by a bank out of Texas. So what happens in a case like that is the title company will get all the documents together. They will then overnight those documents to the bank and the bank will sit with their closing officer and sign the paperwork and their closing officer will notarize them. They will then put all those documents into an overnight envelope, send them back to the closing agent so that when the buyer comes in at the scheduled time of four o'clock the next day, buyer comes in, sits down, the title agent or the closing officer will grab that FedEx envelope and they will open it in front of you. Zip, pull out all the documents, have you sign them and give you your copy and send a copy back to the bank overnight the next day. So it could be done because you can't be at the same time. It could be done because you're not in the same location. Now, I will tell you, those are the most two common ways. In the technology that we have created and due to COVID, there have been issues or advancements, if you will, on how stuff close. <clears throat> I had one close and I'm gonna call it the A&W root beer stand method. 
You guys remember A and W root beer? You guys may be a little young, but A and W. Uh, what's another one? I think Sonic may do this, where you pull up in your car and you order in your car, and they bring the food to you, and you sit in the, and they put it on the tray in the window, and you sit in your car and eat. Uh, remember that? We had a couple closings during the 2020 time frame where title companies literally told us, all right, buyers pull up in the parking lot and sellers pull up in the car beside them. And then I pulled up in another car over here beside my buyer. And, you know, you're looking over at your buyer and you're going, call me. <laughs> so what happened was the title company actually guy ran out to the car handed the documents through the window to the buyer who then he ran back in and called the buyer and called me on a group call and explained all the documents and the buyer sat in their car and signed everything. Then the guy came out, grabbed that stack of documents, ran over to the seller's car, handed it through the window, went back in and called them and their agent and signed all the seller side of the documents and then came and got the completed package, ran back in, made copies of everything and came back out and gave everybody. He went down the line, my car, their car, the seller's car, the seller's agent's car and handed out the documents. So it was kind of like face to face, but we actually sat in separate vehicles, you know, just waving to each other and call me and doing stuff like that. So it was pretty different. You may run into a situation where buyers and sellers have created a hostile environment with each other, and you may opt to be sitting in separate rooms. I've seen this happen. You may both show up at four o'clock, but one sits in room A by themselves with you, and one sets in room B, and the title officer actually runs across from room to room back and forth. Uh, they did that near the end of COVID, where they let them in the building, but to reduce exposure, they put them in different rooms. So there's that. I've had situations where my clients couldn't be in the same room with each other because of a court order. There was a restraining order against one of the uh, sellers. So I actually went in and closed with one of my sellers. And then two hours later, the other seller came in and signed. And we had to almost sign in escrow just for the sellers because they weren't allowed to be in the same room to, with each other. Um, as you guess, it was a divorce case. All right. So that is the closing in escrow. That is kind of the second way that they will do all of this. And here's all the stuff that happened. Now, should one of the office, one of the science sites not close, meaning they couldn't make it, something happened, then all of those documents get returned back to the original person. All right. So we have had that happen where a one side of the deal was on the way and was in a car accident and couldn't actually attend. So all of the documents went back to the original party and anything that was signed obviously was negated and not recorded. And of course, it is not truly transferred because remember, even if the seller signs the deed, What's the requirement for transfer? Remember, I've said it, and it's two parts. It must be delivered and accepted. So even if the seller signs the deed and the buyer never shows up to accept it, property's not transferred. So even in the escrow, the seller can sign the deed, but it's still his house until, say, 4 o'clock when the buyer comes in and, and gets his paperwork and the title company goes, okay, congratulations, here's your paperwork. And the buyer reaches up and takes that document, even though it was signed at 9 a.m., 
it wasn't delivered until four, that's when the property transfers. Same thing with a bank. Even though the bank signed it yesterday in Texas, possession or ownership has not transferred because now the buyer comes in at four o'clock, does all their signature, and the closing offer says, congratulations, here's your documents. And the buyer reaches up at that time and accepts the deed, then it transfers. All right. So don't worry about things that are being held in escrow ever being executed unlegally, illegally, because the escrow company will hold that. Okay. So let's talk about some of the special legislation that affects the closing.